Good morning. My uh, presentation is going to be flat-footed, especially after what we've heard. I like distinction of concepts and precision of ideas. And you will immediately see from my presentation that I have no lovely pictures and so on. But I do try to present a problem and, and try and give a solution. The problem is why political success eludes classical liberals. And I'll try and see whether we can change that situation. Now, voters are not classical liberals. And that's uh, the first difficulty that we have, which is that if we live in a democracy and voters are, on the whole, not classical liberals, it's very difficult for classical liberal ideas in economics to, uh, to be applied. Uh, to the first distinction is, I'm, I'm a classical liberal, not an American liberal. And uh, it means that I don't believe in human rights, but in individual liberties especially when the rights include, as the United Nations Human Rights List, paid holidays, then I think that the main bulwark of freedom is private property and the free market. Uh, liberalism is a political framework. It doesn't solve all your problems. You need to have a morality or different moralities within the framework that allows you to be free and then the full personal responsibility that a classical liberal wants is undermined by welfare state liberalism. So I'm not a follower of, of Ted Kennedy. <laughs> and I hope he doesn't put me under water. <laughs> American conservatives, however, have been allies of classical liberals. They have in common with us respect for the free market, private property, free public expression of religion, uh, responsible behavior. Um, but they do have peculiar policies sometimes, the, uh, using federal money to have no child left behind simply doesn't work, but also is against what we believe. Guantanamo and close interrogation methods, there's water again, um, is something that we don't like and we don't mind having some terrorist risk if the, the cost of avoiding it is invading private uh, in, uh, freedoms. And finally, we want to have uh, a foreign policy that all helps freedom and democracy. In that sense, some conservatives were like that. President Bush was like that. And then they don't like immigration wholly, and we tend to like it. European conservatives, at a pinch, could be classical liberals. A, a very small pinch, I must say. <laughs> respect for private property is there free enterprise in common with us, but they want the common good as the main political uh, value. And we tend to think of individual, the individual good as the main political value. Then they have a suspicion of free market, profit and speculation. We've seen that coming up again uh, with the present crisis. And also they think of solidarity rather than free trade. And uh, they are still welfare state conservatives, so I'm not one of those three uh, groups. Now, democracies are ambivalent, the, but the preference of the majority of voters is, is for welfare state liberalism, except, especially in Europe. And though they are aware, voters, of the malfunction of welfare, delivering goods and services, health, education, equality, and reduced income uncertainty, they go on voting for the welfare state. And now we have the pretext, the present day pretext. Global warming, smoking and obesity, unfair labor competition, unequal opportunities, you should be always equal. I wonder why opportunities should be equal when you're five and not when you're 70. I want to have a clean okay? I wonder why at 70 I shouldn't get equal opportunity and we should all share, I should share into all the, all Mr. Boutin's um, well, and start again uh, at a level with him. So you have then poverty and underdevelopment as a pretext for intervention, and now the banking crisis and the recession. So the monster is still there and rearing its ugly head. Now, however, we are not quite on the road to serfdom to use the title of, uh, of Isaac. I think that there are a number of things that are stopping democracy from going the whole hog into oppression. And we have the market is still a source of freedom, 
personal freedoms are a, a barrier to oppression, and people realize that their political preferences, those welfare state liberals, uh, liberal preferences, don't really work. They are difficult to apply, and they don't function. And this is the, the chink where I want classical liberals to go into democracy and change it from the inside. Um, there are a number of philosophies of, of liberal democracy. Of democracy, uh, Schumpeter, the great cynic, was uh, who's adored in uh, business schools. Schumpeter's always there. Well, he really was a horrible man, <laughs> and because he wrote a book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, two years before before the, the, the road to serfdom by Hayek, that really was. Uh, shocking but interesting. Um, he thought that creative destruction through progress was necessary, but it was not accepted by the, the democracies, by voters. Therefore, and also you had Pareto's law, law of difference in, in income that you couldn't change. There's always going to be people at the top and people at the bottom when you have distribution of income. And also, he thought, and he's wrong, that oligopoly was the result of the free market. Yeah, yeah, he's wrong. And he thought that factory discipline was very important. That's why I carry a tie and I'm not dressed like you people. Uh, one needs to be respectable and so on. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that you have to force on people so that they work hard and well for society and also accept creative destruction. So he said, let's have elections every four years. It doesn't matter very much. People think they govern society, but they don't, um, because behind the elections what we'll have is prime trade unions, we'll have uh, firms that make you come on time uh, at work, and you will have all this creative destruction, and you people think that you're governing it, but you're not. Um, the old cynic had some right things to do. Then there are the, the people who believe that you can be only a democrat. You don't need to be a classical liberal. If you have a democracy and you uh, set it up properly, <laughs> then society will be all right. And I've named a number of people there, Dahl, who think that uh, democracy allows you to govern yourself, whichever way you govern yourself. Habermas thinks that democracy is, is talking uh, to each other and having a chat in India and coming to a conclusion. Rawls uh, tries to achieve an overlapping conclusion, consensus in societies, and so on. But that, where does this leave us? Well, uh, we are an unlikely choice in this kind of process. <clears throat> now, rootless liberalism is the one I alluded to, which is the only morality you must have is to respect other people. As long as you respect them and don't take away their rights, you can live as you wish. And uh, uh, you have no, there's no, uh, no idea of trying to work for the best. Simply let yourself go and do whatever you think that you ought to do. And somebody who, uh, eh, who takes drugs and doesn't work at all and is bad for his family and so on is, is just as good as somebody who has a lovely family, works hard, invents new ideas and, and so on. So this kind of ruthless liberal, you have, you have it very much uh, in the whole of the Western world. Now, you can try to solve the problem of democracy and liberalism by distinguishing between the discussion for long-term constitutions and everyday political decisions. Long-term constitutions, if you assume that people do not know what they're going to be in the future, but they, they, they have their own you know, color and intelligence and wishes and so on, but you don't know what you're going to be in the future, you will work, vote for a constitution that stops the people who are in the majority to, to tread on you. So when you have a constitution that is for the long term, people will tend to have a constitution that is more pro-individual liberty. <clears throat> so he distinguishes between the rules that we all agree so that when you're in power and I'm in opposition, I still can live on, and you won't take away my wife and my property. And the, the other thing is, every day within this constitution, how we, uh, how we work uh, politically. Now, this is, I think, not enough. Formal democracy is not enough in this sense, because 
we know of constitutions written for the long term, the Spanish constitution, and that uh, was not one of a, of a Buchanan type. We had lots of the, the precaution that people on the right and the left did uh, had in writing this constitution is, let's put in a clause that allows us to do what we want when the time comes. In the Spanish constitution, you have, you have an article that allows planning. And that says that property uh, is a social service and you shouldn't exploit property if it does harm to common good and so on. So I don't think this works totally. So let's have a look at the malfunctions of democracy. So it doesn't mean that I don't know that democracy doesn't work well. It's not an ideal system. And this is known, it's been known for a long time, beginning of the 20th century, Moscow's law of organization, Graham Wallace, uh, and human nature <coughs> politics and so on, and Ortega and the rebellion of masses. Public choice is what under, underlines the shortcomings of, of democracy. We have rational voter ignorance and ideology, voters bound with rationality, medium voter, entry, and so on. We could go into, into public choice to see what, what it makes the more democracy in a perfect system. So it's very difficult to be only a Democrat. You have to be a Democrat and also a classical liberal because this system is a dangerous one and one doesn't work unless it has some mixture of the other. Now, people have proposed different remedies for democratic uh, defects, uh, the division of powers. Um, it doesn't work very well, as we'll see, containment of politics and the wider world for the market, or even democratic participation. But these remedies don't work very well. Mm -hmm. The division of powers it has been eroded, even in America. Uh, the Swiss model also is growing more centralized. Uh, we have uh, the, the, uh, the, the Constitution, the uh, Supreme Court in the States is becoming like, uh, like a third chamber because it makes it really changes laws. Individual rights, as you see, uh, are designed in the Supreme Court. And then you have this idea of republicanism, is that everything should be put to a vote. And we should all live together, always in a, in a room where we discuss before it was a smoke-filled room, now it's forbidden. So it'll be a room where we discuss about everything, what should be taught in our schools, whether what bars are open to smoking or not, and uh, how quickly we should drive on the roads and so on. All this should be by agreement. And so it makes life political, and you don't do much uh, else than discuss. All right, now, we classical liberals are like systems, always pushing a rock up, a rock up the mountain, and then it falls back with us. And there's a book by Wegener, and here's where I come to studying the solutions to the problem that I have, which is that we, um, that, that we classical liberals are not, are never in power really, the minority just in Germany, it's a minority party, the Liberal Party. When I was in politics, I was in a minority of one within the Conservatives, and that didn't do much work, not, not good. So, Gerhard Wegner has written a book called Political Failure by Agreement. And it's an interesting fact because it means that if people vote, they will vote for the wrong thing. Now that's very un unnerving and unsettling because I know I'm rational, but I tend to think that you two, you also are rational and intelligent. So uh, I don't want to be a, a liberal dictator, which is a contradiction in terms, I would like to see how we could all get together to have uh, a, a, a classical democracy, a classical liberal democracy rather than the thing that we have. So why is it that the welfare state has been contained in some sense? Not today under Obama, because now we're having socialized medicine and other things, and also looking after the climate, another new um, faith uh, healing, faith healing uh, nostrums, but there are, there are two ideas in being. One, we classical liberals are under a disadvantage in explaining what we want because what we're thinking, what we're proposing for society is unknown. We don't know what the future is. So it's very difficult. My wife, when I used to say, well, we have to close the coal mines in Spain. And she said, well, what shall we do about the miners? How do we give them jobs? I said, I didn't know we have good minds. Couldn't, couldn't know. Give them jobs, my God, no, they'll find it. 
oh, you can't say that. You won't get any votes for that. <laughs> but exactly that. So we are at a disadvantage because we don't know what society will look like when we're free. So uh, what he's saying is that the free market doesn't have, uh, doesn't have an aim, doesn't have an end. It works in ways that we cannot foresee. So it's very difficult to, to, to tell people, uh, will you please be, uh, confide in the wisdom of the market? And they say, where will the market take us? How many jobs will it create? I don't know. And I couldn't know. So we are really under a disadvantage. So the only thing we know is what doesn't work. And so we can say, that no, your things don't work. And give them up somehow. This is the next one is a distinction between preference and choice that Wegener makes. Preference, people want welfare state liberalism. Choice is when they come to apply welfare state liberalism and find many other things don't work. And then they will take their welfare state liberalism with a pinch of salt. There'll be the unreliability of pay as you go public pensions, and say, all right, we want a pension for it. Guaranteed pension. But in the end, the state goes broke. Ah, oh, what should we do then? And then unemployment scrounging, unemployment um, benefit scrounging. The minimum wage, the minimum wage creates unemployment. So why shouldn't we give a minimum wage to all the, uh, all the young that come in? Well, then you have a 20% unemployment of people from 16 to 25 here in Spain. And it's a 40% in Andalusia, by the way. And uh, reduction of productivity and work tends to marginal taxes. The failure, the glaring failure of public education. Of course, education should all be private. Um, and we have public ed free public education in our constitution. Of course, it won't work. And so, what we do is to say, all right, I know your preferences, but would you please look at what the consequences are? And will you learn? And so, the solution is learning, trying to reach comprehensive constitutional pact, perhaps, and <laughs> Doubts about the reality of economic theory, we should fight them. And the fiscal system should be geared to compensating perhaps losers. Um, can we establish institutions that give us a solid currency, solid money? Uh, so in the end, what I'm, that was, what I'm saying is that on, on the whole, liberalism is a learning process. And the idea that you learn what doesn't work about welfare state liberalism and you hope for the best if you open up to freedom is the kind of thing that we heard in the last uh, video but with the wrong metaphor it's not a machine a machine is, I, mean, I can see the God in the machine uh, dealing with our lives no, it's, it's the spontaneous order it's this web that we've created is a spontaneous order we don't know where to take us we don't know what to do, it would be good for us Try and convince people who have newspapers, who have television stations, they should open up to this new order. So the spontaneous order is another cause, another fountain for, lib uh, for, for classical liberals influencing democracy. In sum, yes, voters want uh, a guarantee of their income. Yes, they want free, uh, free uh, medical insurance. They want free schooling, they want free or, or guaranteed pensions and all the things, all that. And they want unions and they want all, all the things that we know are wrong. But, uh, all right, those are wrong. But how can, what can we say? We can show the bad consequences of what they want and then say, come on with me. Maybe, maybe the thing will work better if we don't use your ideas. So there will be the distinction between your preferences and your actual political choices if we show them that their preferences lead to something they don't want. And so, that uh, in the end, uh, think tanks and universities are there to teach liberalism. Minority liberal parties can build coalitions, as they are doing now in Germany. Uh, <clears throat> the Chancellor has said, don't you think, liberals, that you're going to have a, an Anglo-Saxon kind of market? No, 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 we have to control the market because look at what it did to us. Uh, and then the idea is to be a Trojan horse, to, uh, to go to uh, 
in front of Troy, and be in the horse, look very mild and good, and then when they open the horse, out come the ideas of freedom and free trade and free <laughs> liberalism, and so we'll change society somewhat. Thank you very much.